Me levanto en las noches, estoy asomándome a la calle. He tenido que evitar con mi familia. No soy periodista del silencio. Quiero seguir viviendo, quiero seguir respirando. Morir sería dejar de, de escribir. Those were the words of Mexican journalist Javier Valdez Cárdenas before he paid the ultimate price, his life, for relentlessly exposing the drug trafficking ring in Sinaloa, Mexico. But as devastating as his death was, he's just one example of many journalists mercilessly murdered by these criminal organizations. So here are five of them who pissed off the wrong cartels. Number five. Jeanette Bedoya Lima. And speaking out on behalf of victims of sexual violence in Colombia, all women and girls are in your debt. That was Jeanette Bedoya Lima receiving an award for her bravery as an investigative journalist in Colombia. But that's just one side of her story. The other one entails her getting kidnapped, raped, and tortured, not once, but twice. In 2000, the first time this happened was when 26-year-old Lima worked alongside Ignacio Gomez, another investigative journalist at the Bogota Daily Newspaper. Lima at the time was covering a very crucial story on the Colombian war against terrorism. While investigating a story on arms trafficking by both state officials and the paramilitary group called the United Self-Defense Forces of Colombia. As she was covering that story, she had received an invitation from a convicted killer simply known as The Baker. He wanted to meet with Lima and give her all the information she needed at the infamous La Modelo prison near Bogota. She went with an editor and a photographer, but when they arrived, things got hazy. Both the photographer and the editor mindlessly stepped out for a few minutes while they awaited clearance from prison wards to enter the facility. But by the time they got back, Lima was gone. No screams were heard, no signs of struggle, and certainly no eyewitnesses willing to speak. Lima later revealed that she was approached by a man with a scar over one eye, who wore shiny shoes and also shoved a gun right below her waist. He took her out of the prison facility through another exit while prison wardens watched remorselessly. Then a mysterious group of men beat her to a pulp and violated her sexually while repeating the words, Pay attention, we're sending a message to the press in Colombia. When they were done, they threw her semi-conscious body into a dump pile beside the road. But by evening that day, she was discovered by a taxi driver who immediately drove her to the hospital. Lima barely survived that attack and you'd think she'd quit or run away like any normal person would, right? Well, not Lima. Just like the words of Vincent Van Gogh, Lima had put her heart and soul into her work and she had lost her mind in the process. She didn't quit. Instead, she went harder on her quest to uncover the truth. Sadly, it led to another kidnapping. And this time, they went harder on her. In 2001, a year after the incident, Lima was hired by El Tiempo, a Colombian newspaper, and was put in charge of its law enforcement coverage, including reporting on the war between FARC guerrillas, the paramilitary group, the armed forces, and the Colombian government. Before this, though, Lima had received international recognition in the U.S. for her unwavering commitment to her job. This recognition also played a positive role in her career. It served as a bit of protection for Lima from more violence. She had received a telegram from the boss of the paramilitary forces saying she had nothing to fear from them. The FARC guerrilla chiefs gave her similar assurances, but it was simply bait to lure her into another trap. August 2003, she traveled to the town of Puerto Alvira to report on how it had been captured and held by the FARC guerrillas for more than a year forcing its 1,100 inhabitants into full-time cocaine production. When they arrived, an FARC guerrilla leader instructed their kidnapping and took away their cameras, cell phones, and clothes. The leader also ordered the people not to speak to or feed them. However, they defied his rules. They not only gave them food, but also tried getting them help after they heard that the leader was planning to kill them. Once again, though, Lima cheated the hands of death after a senior FARC commander was alerted of the situation. He immediately got her released, apologizing on behalf of the leader who ordered that kidnapping in the first place. 
Lima had become a household name in Colombia, and messing with her wouldn't have been just a national issue, but an issue that would have definitely brought questions from international organizations. This is partly the reason why Lima is still alive today. Aside from the fact that the drug trafficking scene in Colombia is slowly deteriorating, Lima has claimed so many awards and international recognition for her job that she's regarded as the face of journalism in Colombia. But this next journalist on our countdown is regarded as her Mexican counterpart. Number 4. Annabel Hernandez The most powerful men in the government want to kill me because I reveal in my book that he was in the payroll of the Sinaloa cartel. In 2010, there were a lot of people that wanted Annabelle dead. The Sinaloa cartel, the Mexican government, and a faction of the US government, all because of a book she wrote that exposed their dealings in detail. She became wanted in Mexico and had to flee the country with her family. But this wasn't the life she always wanted for herself. Born in 1971, Annabelle dreamt of being a lawyer as a kid. However, that dream couldn't come to fruition after she noticed the bias in Mexico's news reports on the drug war. A lot of killings were going on in different states, but far less were being reported. Reporters and journalists shied away from these types of stories in order not to get killed. But not Annabelle. At just 21 years old, she started her own newspaper called Reforma. She was still in school at the time, and her first front-page story was about electoral fraud in Mexico City. It was a powerful one, grabbing the attention of many. Three years later, Annabelle was pregnant with her first child, and ultimately her work got the attention of the Mexican government. She kept changing jobs because of unofficial reports that the Mexican government tried censoring her work. This didn't stop Annabelle, but it landed her in a lot of trouble. December 5th, 2000. Annabelle received a phone call from her mother, telling her that her father hadn't come home the night before. Annabelle and her family members began the search by first calling local hospitals to find out if he'd been brought in. Then they would call a radio station reporting him and his car missing. Immediately after they did this, someone had called back informing them they'd found his car. Annabelle's brother went to that given location and found an extremely horrific scene. The car was parked by the roadside, while Mr. Hernandez's shoes were in the trunk. They were stained all over with his blood. By evening, his body was found on a highway outside Mexico City. He was confirmed dead. This man was a victim of Annabelle's war on the entire narcotics underworld. The police told the family they'd be willing to investigate this murder if the Hernandez family paid him to do it. At this point, it was obvious Annabelle had suffered a loss for pissing off the powers that be. But she wasn't ready to retreat. Rather, she wanted revenge. In 2001, while working with a major newspaper in Mexico, Annabelle exposed a story about how the winning Mexican presidential candidate at the time, Vicente Fox, used public funds extravagantly to decorate his personal space. This was despite his campaign promises of economic austerity. The newspaper revealed expense reports from President Fox's government, uncovering overcharges, unverified purchases, and connections to non-existent companies. The story gained international recognition and even earned Annabelle an award. But she wouldn't stop here either. In 2010, she dropped a book that exposed in grave detail the relationship between the cartels, El Chapo, the Mexican government, and the United States. The book took five years of research and was titled Los Señores del Narco, or Narco Land, The Mexican Drug Lords and Their Godfathers. According to this book, Annabelle stated that the government, its policies, the military, and the entire financial sector of Mexico are structured in a way that gives power to the cartels and makes drug trafficking possible. She went further, claiming that under President Vincente Fox, the relationship between the cartels and the government changed, as Fox sided with the Sinaloa cartel by letting Joaquin El Chapo Guzman escape prison in 2001. To top it all off, she claimed the DEA had a secret deal with traffickers in the illegal importation of fentanyl and methamphetamine claiming the agencies make billions of dollars off this trade in the U.S. 
Annabelle was like a one-man army, ready to burn the entire narcotics underworld to the ground. Sadly, they fired back. Annabelle received multiple death threats from the government of Mexico itself. One of the officers she specifically exposed, Gennaro Garcia Luna, who apparently fooled Mexicans by claiming he'd fight against drug cartels, meanwhile he was receiving millions of dollars in bribes from the Sinaloa cartel, tried to assassinate her. He sent his men to her home, but lucky for her, she was out that day and had escaped death. Now as courageous as she was, Annabelle was still human, and she did fear death. This would make her leave Mexico a few months later, and despite all her efforts, the corruption in Mexico still stands. The cartels still reign supreme, but at least she achieved her goal. I'm glad that I still be alive to be able to publish these stories because I think that people deserve to know. People need to know what is happening there. Number 3. Enrique Quintanilla August 9, 2006. The bruised and lifeless body of Enrique was found outside the city of Chihuahua with two gunshots to his head and back. Now this was his punishment for messing with the infamous Juarez cartel. But they weren't the only ones after him. A faction of the Mexican government also wanted him dead. And you wouldn't even believe the cruel reason why. Now his journey to becoming wanted by both these groups began when he started his own investigative magazine titled Dos Caras, Una Verdad, which translates to Two Sides, One Truth. He founded this magazine in 2005, after working 20 years as a crime reporter and investigative journalist. His aim was to uncover the men behind the countless homicides and drugs trafficked in Chihuahua. And you'd really have to commend his boldness because Chihuahua at that time was one of the worst places to be in Mexico. It was governed by Mexican state officials, but the Juarez cartel had the final say on all affairs. The cartel was responsible for transporting billions of dollars worth of illegal drug shipments into the US. Now at the same time they were in a battle with the Sinaloa cartel over those borders. This led to countless homicides within and outside the city. This place is also home to some of the most corrupt Mexican cops and officials. I mean, how do you even get tons of cocaine across the border without being stopped? The cartel streamlines millions into the pockets of these officials to keep their mouths shut, and anyone who dared step in their way would find themselves six feet under. In simpler terms, Chihuahua was a modern-day Gotham City. And Quintanilla took up the role of Batman, trying to keep that place clean. However, in this version, Batman died. Now, before all this happened, Quintanilla used his magazine to fight for justice. It was strictly crime-related, and it was known for criticizing the Mexican government for those high homicide rates in the state of Chihuahua, particularly the executions between rival drug cartels. He also would write about corrupt officials, unsolved murders, and drug trafficking activities. The implication of this was that he was harassed on multiple occasions. However, just a few days before he was murdered, he exposed photos and documents that gave in sufficient detail government officials involved in the drug trade. It even implicated the then governor of Chihuahua, Jose Reyes Baeza Terrazas. This was the trigger that provoked Quintanilla's death. August 8, 2006. Quintanilla was last seen leaving his office at around 11 a.m., and he would never return home that night. His family reported him missing the next day, and his body was found by Mexican authorities dumped along a roadside the following day. His lifeless body displayed harrowing evidence of torture, marred wounds from a 45 cal pistol to his head and back. Police noticed a chilling resemblance, symbolizing an execution style favored by the Juarez cartel. But this theory of theirs was disproved a few years later. October 12, 2012. Mexican media house TV Azteca got a video from an anonymous user showing two naked men with clear signs of having undergone torture, confessing their involvement in the assassination of Quintanilla. The alleged killers, Leopoldo Rodriguez Garcia and Armando Duarte Escobedo, were interrogated by an unseen man heard in the background of the video clip and they both admitted that they had killed this man on the orders of three drug lords of the Juarez cartel. A few weeks later, another video was posted on the Mexican news website El Diario de Chihuahua. In this video, the brother of the Chihuahua state attorney general, 
Mario Angel Gonzalez, was seen handcuffed and surrounded by at least five masked gunmen carrying assault rifles. After answering some questions, the man confessed that his sister, Patricia Gonzalez, the state attorney general, had ordered the execution of Quintanilla and Armando Rodriguez Carrion, another journalist. Many people interpreted this as the cartel forcing the real killers to confess to their crimes. They tried pinning his death on the cartel, but they in turn produced the real killers. The only problem was they did it six years after his death, and also after a set of gunmen killed one of his sons, Jonathan Perea Cardenas, in 2009. Number 2. Javier Valdez Cardenas May 15, 2017, Javier was brutally shot 12 times by an unidentified gunman in Culiacan, Sinaloa. His death brought an end to decades of trying to expose the Sinaloa cartel and all its operations. Now the question is, how did it happen? Javier was born on April 14, 1967, in the same city where he was killed. As a teenager, he became real familiar with the violence in the area. We had cocaine, meth, kidnapping, human trafficking, you name it. But unlike every other teenager who felt they didn't have a choice, Javier had the balls to bring him down. He got a degree in sociology from the Autonomous University of Sinaloa, and then got a job as a reporter for the national TV station, Canal 3. And that's when things started getting interesting. He worked with a handful of news stations throughout the 90s, but Javier wasn't satisfied with their level of competence when it came to addressing the affairs of criminal organizations. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying they were corrupt, I'm saying they were playing it safe, maybe too safe for Javier. So he would start his own newspaper called Rio Doce. Now this publication was a blessing and a curse for Cardenas. You know why? On one hand, he was able to uncover some of the deepest and dirtiest reports on organized crime. On the other, he became a huge target for these criminals. Regardless, he wasn't willing to stop exposing them. He published several books on drug trafficking, including a few that gained international recognition. One that really stood out was Miss Narco, detailing the lives of girlfriends and wives of drug lords, along with disgusting levels of debauchery some of these women face against their will. And just to put into context how dangerous things were for him back then, the former Mexican president, Felipe Calderón, had just resumed office and dispatched around 6,000 Mexican army soldiers to Michoacán and Sinaloa. Their aim? Wipe out corruption. Now this period was by far one of the most intense in Mexico's fight against drug trafficking. The streets were filled with blood, bullets, and dead bodies. More than 14,500 people died in a span of about three years. And still with no guns or bodyguards, this man kept digging deep into the works and affairs of the Sinaloa cartel. Until they finally attacked. September 2009, unidentified assailants hurled a grenade into Rio Doce's facilities causing substantial damage to that building. Thankfully, no one was injured, but that attack came as a result of a key publishing Cardenas made less than 24 hours prior. The piece was titled, Hitman, Confession of an Assassin in Ciudad Juarez. And believe me when I say the publication caused a huge stir in public opinion. Remarkably, he continued exposing these individuals, and to his surprise, there were no fresh attacks or death threats on his or his family's life until he once again provoked the Sinaloa cartel. In 2011, Javier was awarded the International Press Freedom Award by the Committee to Protect Journalists in New York. In his acceptance speech, he condemned the violence in Mexico and blamed both the citizens and the government for each playing a role in driving the war forward. His speech obviously pissed off the Mexican government, but you know who else it pissed off? That's right, the Sinaloa cartel. And it meant one thing and one thing only, this guy needed to go. May 15th, 2017. Javier was mercilessly shot 12 times by an unidentified gunman around noon, just a few blocks away from his office in Culiacan, Sinaloa. The Mexican authorities couldn't link anyone to the murder, no suspects, no leads, nothing. Now his murder was condemned by the US Embassy in Mexico, the UN, and the EU. He would leave behind his wife, Griselda Triana, who was also a journalist, and his little daughter. And if you're asking what happened to his newspaper, well, they didn't die along with him. It was continued by another news outlet, Forbidden Stories in the German newspaper Zeit Online. So it's safe to say his legacy lives on. 
And number one, Rodolfo Rincón Terracena. Now, Rodolfo joins the long list of journalists murdered for speaking against cartels and drug trafficking in Mexico. But unlike others, Rodolfo died at the hands of the one cartel that rarely ever targets journalists, Los Zetas. January 20th, 2007, five alleged members of Los Zetas reportedly kidnapped, tortured, mutilated, and burned his corpse in Tabasco, Mexico. What led to that brutal attack began with his job as a journalist and investigative crime reporter for a newspaper called Tabasco Hoy. Rodolfo was known for being very direct in his news reports and articles. As a result of this, he received a lot of death threats from suspected drug traffickers. At the time, the Zetas, a breakout faction of the Gulf Cartel, operated in the state of Tabasco. And if you don't know about these people, allow me to educate you a bit. This group is known for their brutal tactics, including beheadings and indiscriminate violence. Their top leaders emerged from the Mexican army, making them one of the most violent cartels in Mexico. Now for context, they were one of the largest cartels in terms of geographical presence in Mexico, outshining even the Sinaloa cartel. And just like that cartel, this group is also concerned with drug trafficking, assassinations, extortion, kidnappings, and a bundle of other illegal activities. So now you know the type of people this guy was dealing with, yet Rodolfo wasn't afraid to expose him in his writing. However, that kind of pissed him off, and he paid with his life. January 20th, 2007. Rodolfo would call his wife from work, telling her that he would be home by late afternoon. But now we know he never made it back. On that day, Rodolfo was working on this article about a group of bank robbers in the area and these gangsters extorting cash machine users in Villa Hermosa, Tabasco. He left the office around 8 p.m. and that was the last time anyone saw him. January passed and so did February and then March without a word or a lead on where Rodolfo might have gone. March 1st, 2010. The Tabasco State Authorities informed through a press conference that Rodolfo had been kidnapped and killed by five alleged members of Los Zetas in retaliation for an article he published a day before that abduction. But here's where things get weird. A couple of suspects confessed to the kidnapping and gruesome acts that killed Rodolfo. They also told the police that his body was burned inside a metal barrel with diesel fuel along with at least four other unidentified victims. His death was based solely on this confession. There was no evidence supporting the claims from these suspects. The police then closed down that investigation and nothing was done afterward. This left his family and friends with just a few questions that needed to be answered. For instance, what if the police had no idea what happened to him and instead decided to put up this charade to get the press off their backs? Why'd they close this investigation without getting any evidence to verify the suspect's claims? And finally, maybe, why haven't you liked this video and subscribed yet? Come on, don't look at me. Go smack those buttons in the face. But at the end of the day, these stories serve as a reminder that being a journalist or a crime investigator is a tasking job, and they must have some level of protection from the government to keep them out of harm's way. 